Good afternoon and welcome. I'm going to take just a moment so that all of the people in attendance can become part of the room. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for taking time from your busy schedules to come to this town hall. One of the traditions that we've created is having an annual alumni town hall where I have the opportunity to talk about the state of the law school and most of all have the opportunity to answer any questions that you have about Berkeley Law. We're starting to emerge from our two years of COVID restrictions. As you know, on March 17th of 2020, we went to entirely online instruction. We we're entirely online for all of the 2020-2021 school year. In the fall, we were back in the building for all in-person classes. For the first three weeks of this semester, we were back online because of the spread of the Omicron variant. And then we moved to in-person classes. This year, we've been entirely in masks Everyone in the building, including instructors and students in the classroom, have to be wearing masks. As of this coming Monday, no longer are masks required, though many, including me, are still requesting that students wear masks in the classroom. And I'm hoping that within a few weeks, even that will be able to be relaxed. Um, there's no doubt that being all online and even being just in masks this year has taken a toll with regard to the community, but I do think we're emerging from all of this. And I do think that overall spirits are good. I'm very honored that on January 5th was announced that I will be doing a second five-year term as Dean. I think the most frightening thing about this is how fast the first five years went by. The first two and a half years I felt was accomplishing so much for the law school. And then the last two years have been more just trying to get through it, but still to advance. And now I'm so excited for all of the things to accomplish in the next five years. I thought that what I would do rather than do an overview of the state of the law school is to talk about what my priorities are for the next five years. So I say there's so much that I want to accomplish. And I think in doing this, I'll have the opportunity to also give you a sense of where we are right now. But I do want to leave most of our time to give you the chance to ask me any questions that you have. The state of the law school is good in every way in which a law school or any institution of higher learning can be evaluated. I think we are on very solid ground. In terms of goals for the next five years, First, I want to put the law school on a very stable, long-term financial footing. As you know, in the years before I arrived, the law school was running a deficit. I am very pleased and proud that each of the years that I've been here, including last year's difficult years of COVID, we've run a budget surplus. I'm particularly proud that we have not had to lay off any staff cut any instructors or classes during the time I'm here. I've said repeatedly that one of my top priorities is to never have to lay off any of our terrific staff or ever in any way impinge our educational program. How have we been able to put ourselves on this better financial footing? Well, one is we got the Regents of the University of California to increase the professional degree supplemental tuition, the tuition our students pay for each of five years um, there had not been an increase in tuition from 2010 to 2019, and we were far behind in tuition what our peer schools were charging. I wish we could stay that way. I wish we could go back to the level of tuition that it was when many of you went to Berkeley Law. My wife went to Berkeley Law and graduated in 1986, and it was $750 a semester. But that's when the state of California was subsidizing Berkeley Law. Now we get net about 5% of our money from the campus in the state of California. We are very close to financially independent. And I fear that's not gonna change. The state of California is no longer subsidizing professional school education. 
Well, the only way then to remain a top school is to charge tuition comparable to what our peer schools charge. And the effect of the increases is that we're still charging less than our peer schools, but we're closer to where they are, and soon we're going to be where they are. And this is true both of peer public schools like University of Virginia and University of Michigan and peer private schools, say Harvard, Yale, Stanford. They all are in about the same tuition range, and that's where we need to go. I wish it were otherwise, but the reality is it's what we have to do. Now, I'm pleased at the same time tuition has gone up, we've dramatically increased our financial aid. When I arrived, our financial aid budget was just under $6 million. This year, our financial aid budget is $22 million. So we have increased the financial aid much more than we've increased tuition. And this is key to making law school affordable. It's crucial in terms of our values with regard to accessibility. We've increased the size of our LLM program. Our LLM are foreign students. They tremendously benefit the law school in all of the experience they bring, but it also helps us financially. We've also really increased our revenue generation. And so we've gone from not bringing in money in terms of executive education to last year bringing in $2 million in executive education. And we continue to try to increase our philanthropy, to increase our annual giving, to increase also the gifts that we receive. Now, I hoped and planned that I'd be able to tell you that the campus was past its financial challenges. Before I arrived, the campus was running a substantial deficit that was then resulting in cuts imposed on the schools. Then the campus lost a lot of money because of COVID. And the campus cut our money each of the last two years. And so my hope is I was going to come to you on March 4th and tell you that the campus is beyond its financial problems. Unfortunately, recent developments mean I can't say that. Um, as I'm sure you've read in the news, last August, a Superior Court judge in Alameda County, as part of a suit of the California Environmental Quality Act, imposed a cap on enrollment for the Berkeley campus. He picked as the number for that cap the 2020-2021 school year. That was a particularly unfortunate year for him to use because that was the year of COVID when campus enrollment was lower. More students chose not to come. The result of his camp and enrollment is that Berkeley has to admit 3,000 fewer students for the coming year than it was planning on. If it was just from freshmen, it would have to admit about 5,000 fewer freshmen than it was planning. If it was just freshmen, it would be instead of a freshman class of 9,000, a freshman class of 6,000. In cost to the campus, that estimates a direct cost of about $60 million. And then that's just lost tuition revenue. Then there's the loss in terms of fees and meal contract and housing contracts. And so it's a loss to the campus of about $100 million. The campus went to the Court of Appeal and asked it for a stay. The Court of Appeal denied the stay. And they then went to the California Supreme Court for a stay. And the California Supreme Court denied a stay. Well, what's it going to mean for the law school? Every program on campus has to cut enrollment. I've agreed that we will cut our enrollment by about 85 students, going from what would have been an entering class of 320 JD students to 270, an LLM class that would have been 240 to 220, and transfers take from what would have been 45 to 30. 85 fewer students, you can do the arithmetic, comes to a loss of about $5.5 million. Our JD students are paying over 60,000 now, both in-state and out-of-state. Our LLM students pay about 70,000. So that's a significant hit for the law school. Plus, if the campus loses a large sum, I expect some of those cuts will be paid on to the school. So next year is going to be a difficult financial year, following other difficult financial years. Thankfully, in the law school, we do have a reserve that we can draw on. Um, again, I'm committed above all, we are not going to lay off any staff. We're not going to cut any educational programs. But once we get past that, and 
I'm hopeful that maybe the California legislature will step in and provide relief to that. Then my goal over the next five years is to make sure they're on a very stable long-term financial footing. It's to make sure that our tuition revenues are comparable with our peer schools. It's to make sure that we have an LLM program that's of the appropriate size, given our physical space. It's very much to increase revenue generation. I've in the last month created a new position in the law school, an assistant dean for executive education and revenue generation. Adam Sterling is gonna occupy this position. And I think there's a good deal more revenue to be generated. And we have to increase our philanthropy. We have to have more support from our alumni, from others who wanna support the programs, the law school. In this regard, we are now in the process of searching for a new assistant dean for development and alumni relations. Mary Matheron retired after wonderful service to the law school and Alex Shapiro, our director of communications, is heading up the search committee. And I'm very hopeful that within the next couple of months or so, next few months, I'll be able to announce to our alumni community our terrific new assistant dean for development alumni relations. A second goal for the next five years concerns physical space. We are out of physical space. We are desperate for physical space for everything. We are out of offices. We are out of space for student meetings. We are out of classrooms relative to the demand. Um, we had a solution in mind that was gonna get us some additional space. And then if you've been at meetings in past years, you heard me talk about it. Above where I'm sitting right now in the law building, the top two floors were library stacks. And in 2012, when the new building was finished, the materials in those stacks, the books, were taken to the new library building. There weren't funds at that time to renovate those two floors, and so they were left empty. They're just used for storage now. Well, with our being desperate for space, we chose that we were going to convert those two floors to usable space. Charles Cannon headed this up. We worked with architects, we drew plans, we worked with campus, we got approvals, and it was all set to begin construction on May 18th, 2020. It was gonna cost us about $18 million. It'd give us just under 15,000 square feet of usable, usable space. Um, actually, it was gonna cost about $20 million and we had $18 million in reserves. We're gonna have to come up with $2 million. I became very worried in early March, 2020, as the COVID pandemic was spreading. I worried that we were gonna use all of our reserves and then some for this. And I had no idea what 2020-21 was gonna bring in terms of our finances. So I went to the vice chancellor on campus, Rosemary Ray, and said that I thought we should put on hold the library stacks conversion project. She agreed. And so the construction didn't start May 18th. It was supposed to be done by fall 2021. We came back this fall and we looked into it. And now it'll cost almost $27 million to do the same construction because of an increase in materials and labor. We don't have $27 million in our reserves. And I also worry about what we'd be getting for the money. The provost told me that this would be the most expensive construction project in the history of the campus, including lab space. So now we're looking at other alternatives. I've created a space planning committee and I've asked them to develop a plan in the short term, the medium term, and the long term for our space. And I wanna be sure that that plan is in place, that the plan is being executed before I finish being Dean in five years. The third top priority is to continue to recruit and retain outstanding faculty. There's nothing more important to the quality of any educational institution than its faculty. I am very proud that since 2017, the year I arrived, Berkeley Law has added 20 new faculty. My guess is that we're the only law school in the country that's added 20 faculty in this time. And we have added superb faculty by every measure. We've hired great lateral candidates. 
to mention just a few. Kiara Bridges, who came from Boston University. Jennifer Chacon, who came from UCLA Law School. Jonah Gelbach, who came from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Jonathan Glader from UCLA Law School. David Graywell, who's a professor at Yale Law School. Oren Kerr from the University of Southern California Law School. And these are just a few of the tenured lateral professors that we've been able to attract. We've also hired terrific entry-level faculty. And we need to continue to hire outstanding faculty of this caliber. At this moment, we have 11 open faculty slots to fill this year. We have one offer already accepted. Sharon Jacobs, who's a professor at the University of Colorado, who specialized in energy and environmental law. She withdrew from consideration at University of Michigan, University of Virginia to accept our offer. And we have a number of offers out and plan to make more offers this spring. Of those 11, two of them will be clinical professors. We also have a number of additional slots to fill next year. And we need to just continue to hire the very best law professors. But we also have to retain our faculty. We have so many faculty at this point who have permanent or visiting office or are visiting at other law schools. I think we have three faculty visiting at Harvard and four are visiting our offers from Stanford. Um, and then we can go on with those offers or visiting offers from NYU, Columbia, University of Chicago, University of Pennsylvania, and so on. We need, and we do work very hard to retain each of these faculty members when they offers, have offers elsewhere. Um, there's things we can do though, and there's things we can't do. Um, we have uh, the ability to match salaries from other schools, but the other peer schools can offer things we can't. Our peer schools have college tuition remission for faculty children. I was at Duke before I came to the University of California and they pay for three quarters of faculty members college, a child's college tuition at any college or university in the country after three quarters of the Duke tuition. Um, we have a professor who's just gotten a tenured offer from Harvard and they pay for the children of faculty members to go to college anywhere in the country. Also, the other schools have large housing subsidies. Um, I just saw what was offered to this professor who got a tenured offer from Harvard. We don't have those kinds of housing subsidies. So it makes it a challenge to retain faculty. It's terrific that we have a faculty that's in such demand by all of these schools. It's really a reflection of the quality of the Berkeley Law faculty but I wouldn't mind if these other schools would show a little bit less love to our faculty and not recruit them so hard. So I think that there is no priority in the next five years that's more important than continue to recruit and retain great faculty. Um, related to that, my fourth priority is to continue to attract the very top law students by all measures to Berkeley Law. Here, I'm very proud of what we've been able to accomplish in the five, for last five years, and we need to even do more in the next five years. There's traditional measures of the so-called quality of an entering class, median LSAT and median GPA. When I arrived, the median LSAT was 167. We moved it to 168. This year, the median LSAT of the entering class is 169. I am hopeful that the median LSAT of next year's entering class will be 170. We've moved the median GPA. At the same time, I'm so pleased, so proud that we've been able to increase the diversity of our student body. When I arrived, there were 12 black students in the first year class. I was so worried that this would create a vicious cycle. Prospective black students would come here and see very few black students and then choose to go elsewhere. We worked very hard to figure out what was the cause of the problem. And we discovered it wasn't a lack of applications. It wasn't a failure to admit. It was that the students we admitted were going elsewhere. So we decided to develop a strategy of aggressive recruitment. And this relied heavily on you, our alumni, to reach out to admitted students, to convince them to come here. My second year here, we had 28 black students. 
more than doubling it from when I arrived. We then increased it to 33, then to 43, and this year again, about 43 Black students in the entering class. We have substantially increased our Latino students. Just from last year to this year, doubled our Latino students, though I think that large an increase is also somewhat of a statistical anomaly. We've increased our number of Asian students. We've increased our number of Native American students. Um, we're also now about two thirds women students in the first year class. Of the top 20 law schools, we have the largest percentage of women students. Now, all of this goes on without any preference being given on account of race or gender in admissions. Proposition 209 says we can't give preference on basis of race or gender. So all of this is consistent with the constitution. And it also belies any thought that there's a trade-off between the traditional measures of quality and diversity. We've dramatically increased both in the last five years and we need to do that. Yeah, I wanna increase and enhance our public mission. I think that what makes Berkeley Law different from our peer schools is our public mission. We're an excellent law school. I think we're as good as any law school in the country. And I can point to you to statistical measures to support that. But there are other excellent law schools. What distinguishes this law school is our public mission, our commitment to using law to make our society and our world a better place. This is manifest in so many things that we do. Our clinics, our centers, our programs, and what we need to do over the next five years is enhance all of these. Let me just say a word about each. In terms of our clinics, we have a terrific in-house clinical program, and we have a close relationship with East Bay Community Law Center. But our in-house clinical program is small relative to the size of our student body. So I have an agreement with the provost on campus they will hire five more in-house clinical professors in the next five years, starting with two additional clinical professors who will hopefully begin July 1st, 2020, 2022. And we're always looking to strengthen our relationship with the East Bay Community Law Center. Our centers are so important to the life of the law school. And we added new centers in the time that I've been here. We created the Berkeley Judicial Institute. Judge Jeremy Fogel, a longtime federal court judge in San Jose, who then spent seven years as the director of the Federal Judicial Center, resigned from the federal bench to come create the Berkeley Judicial Institute. And it does a terrific job of programs for judges, and judges both at the federal and the state level. We've created the Civil Justice Research Initiative, a university based research-oriented center to look at issues with regard to the civil justice system. We've created the Law, Economics, and Politics program to look at issues with regard to political economy and so on. And we need to continue to do this. The programs we put on are so crucial to the intellectual life of the law school. This Monday, we did a program and it's available online on the legal issues related to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It was a terrific panel chaired by Katerina Linos, who's a professor here. She holds the Tragen chair with regard to comparative law. So I will be looking over the next five years to strengthen our public mission. And finally, I wanna do all I can to strengthen our community. Another thing that I think makes Berkeley Law special is its community. I've been a member of the faculty of five different law schools over the last 42 years. I've never seen a more special community than Berkeley Law. Now, the community has taken a hit being apart during COVID and having all the restrictions of COVID. And we need to find ways to bring people together. I've created a number of task forces to help plan for the next five years. One is these is a task force on student life of how can we enhance the student experience here at Berkeley Law. I've asked the Berkeley Alumni Association Board to help guide me on what can we do to improve our relationship with alumni. And one of the things that 
I want to begin doing, and I'm just starting, is to go to cities across the country, to meet our alumni, to talk to you, to help strengthen our bonds with the alumni, because you are such a crucial part of our community. Um, I haven't been able to travel to see people for the last two years. I'm excited to just be beginning that in this month and plan to go over the months ahead, frequently to Los Angeles and to Silicon Valley and to New York and Washington and Chicago and Philadelphia and Denver and places across the country and get the chance to see alumni again. So those are my goals for the years to come. Um, and I, I think I have the, the benefit of having learned a great deal in my first five years and now can build on that knowledge to do everything I can to keep personally strength and to make it even better. Well, my goal was to talk to you for 30 minutes, take questions for 30 minutes. I'm just at the half hour mark. And so I'm glad to take questions about anything that you wanna ask me. Um, and I think the way that I'll do this is just go to the Q&A and read the conditions um, and I'll read the questions and answer them. Is that best, Charles? Or do you want to read me the questions? I will read you the questions. Even better. Two sheets. Okay. All right. First question, Erwin. What will be the law school's approach to admissions in the likely event that SCOTUS eliminates the diversity rationale as a basis for considering race as a factor in admissions decisions? It will not change our admissions at all. Let me explain why, and then I can refer to the cases. As I'm sure you know, in 1996, California, California voters passed Proposition 209. It says that California and all of the entities of the government in California cannot discriminate or give preference on the basis of race or gender in education, contracting, and employment. So the University of California in Berkeley Law have not been able to engage in affirmative action since 1996. And those of you here at law school then saw there was a tremendous decrease in diversity in the number of students of color. But over time, Berkeley has developed methods consistent with Prop 209 of ensuring and enhancing our diversity. But because of Prop 209, whatever the Supreme Court does in these cases, won't affect our admissions. We will be able to continue to do exactly as we're doing now. Now, in terms of the two cases, the Supreme Court's granted review and Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard University and Students for Fair Admissions versus North Carolina, they involve whether college universities can continue to use race as a factor in admissions decisions to benefit minorities and enhance diversity. In 1978, in Regents of the University of California versus Baki, in 2003 in Grutter versus Bollinger, and in 2016 in Fisher versus University of Texas, the Supreme Court said that college universities could use race as one factor in admissions decisions to benefit minorities and enhance diversity. I think now there's a majority on the Supreme Court to overrule those cases. Fisher in 2016 had Justices Kennedy and Ginsburg in the majority, and they're no longer on the court. The reason there's two cases is the Constitution equal protection apply only to the government. That's the University of North Carolina case. But Title VI of the 19th Civil Rights Act says that recipients of federal funds cannot discriminate based on race. That's the Harvard case. But since we do not use race as a factor in admissions, this won't change our admissions, but it will mean that college universities throughout the country will have to deal with what Berkeley has been having to deal with since 1996. Thank you. Is the financial condition of the law school related to the financial condition of the legal profession? Indirectly, not directly. Why indirectly? Well, if lawyers are doing better financially, I hope they'll be more generous in supporting Berkeley Law. Indirectly, of course, we need to make sure that there's always jobs that are available for our students, and that depends on the financial condition of the profession. But the reality is it's indirect. I mean, directly, we are very tuition dependent. Close to 70% over 60% of revenue comes from the tuition that we bring in 
from our JD and LLM students. There's the money from the endowment, but we are very dependent on our alumni support. And so that's the sense in which the financial condition of the profession is linked to the finance of the law school. Um, it's hard to describe for you how important the financial support of alumni is for our financial well being. That's the linkage in answer to the question. When will the considerable contribution and involvement of Elizabeth Jocelyn Bolt to the law school be appropriately and publicly acknowledged on the school's campus? This was promised when the Bolt name was removed from the main law school building. If I could presume as chair of the committee that created the exhibit to give a partial answer. Um, for those of you who have not been in the law building since August of 2021, a large a comprehensive exhibit explaining the history of the Bolt name at the school is installed in the main hallway. Uh, it includes a description of Elizabeth Bolt's trust and her gifts and involvement. And we have also left in place her portrait in the main classroom hall way and the plaque from 1912 dedicated to her and her husband, Irwin. That's exactly what I was gonna say. And I'm thrilled to have the question because we've done exactly what we promised in this regard. Um, I'm gonna start where Charles finished. The main hallway still has the picture of Elizabeth Jocelyn Bolt in the plaque, but there's also a very large wall display that discusses the history of the Bolt name, including the wonderful support of Elizabeth Jocelyn Bolt. And if you haven't been to the law school, please come visit us and you'll see the display. And I think you'll be, based on your question, pleased with it. I'll just add as a footnote that uh, we are creating an online expanded version of the exhibit so that we hope to have that up over the summer. The next question is how has the pandemic affected clinical programs and what is the plan to restore and reinvigorate clinical programs that may have been affected? The clinical programs have continued to operate through the pandemic. So the clinics, that involve court appearances. Those have gone on either virtually or sometimes in person. On Tuesday of this week, we had a group of students go to Alabama to argue a case in the death penalty clinic. In, during the pandemic, courts were continuing to operate often online and the clinics were functioning in that way. Um, some of our clinics are non-litigation oriented, um, if you look at, for example, what the Environmental Law Clinic did in the reports that it issued during the pandemic, there was no slowing of its work at all. Or if you look at the terrific work of our policy advocacy clinic, challenging the court fines and fees, that's gone on unabated during the pandemic. So the clinics did not slow down during the pandemic, though, of course, some work had to shift to online. And the clinics are going full speed ahead. So my commitment is just to hire more clinical faculty so that we can accommodate even more students. We're not keeping up with the demand from students and expanding the clinics will allow us to do so. Is there a unique reason why the library construction project, which was aborted, may, would have been the most expensive in campus history? Is there asbestos or some other complication? Well, Charles, you can answer this better than I can. I think seismic reinforcement is so expensive and given where it's located and the seismic problems with this building, it made it enormously expensive. It also limited the usable space because the need for very large pillars meant we couldn't put classrooms there or large offices there. I think the increase from what we thought two years ago is just because construction costs, labor and materials have gone up so much. But Charles, you spearhead this, that's my sense. Uh, absolutely. I'll add the one important point that the expense per square foot is what we're discussing here. So it would have been the most expensive per square foot uh, construction project. There are very expensive buildings on the campus in comparison. Yes. Uh, here's a question. What is the discounted tuition at the law school after financial aid? And how does the increased financial aid affect planned tuition increases? I don't remember offhand what's the discounted tuition. Um, I can get that statistic. I've heard it many times. It's basically, if you were to take all of the tuition revenue, 
subtract financial aid and then divide by the number of students, you would then get what's called the discounted tuition. Um, but I don't re recall that number offhand. Um, it's crucial as we increase tuition that we, I apologize, that will ring for a moment. Well, let me see if I pick it up and put it down. Um, sorry for the interruption. I don't know how to turn off the telephone from ringing. Um, it's crucial that as we increase financial aid, I'm sorry, as we increase tuition, that we also increase financial aid, and we've done that. But it's also crucial that we increase financial aid beyond just the rate of the tuition increase. So here, if you go to the statistics that I presented, when I arrived for the 2017-2018 budget, our total financial aid budget was about $6 million, under $6 million. Now our total financial aid budget is over $22 million. So financial aid has gone up much more than the rate at which tuition has gone up. And we need to continue to do this. This is again, where our alumni have been so invaluable. Um, the money that you, our alumni have given to the Berkeley Law Fund, I have devoted to financial aid for our students. And many of our alumni have given scholarships money that's devoted specifically to scholarships for our students. And we use every penny of that money in that way. Erwin, what ideally are the skills and values you wish to see in all graduates of Berkeley Law? I want them to have the skills to be terrific lawyers. And everyone in this call, like me, can enumerate the skills that go into being a terrific lawyer whether we're talking about the analytical skills, the writing skills, the public speaking and presentation skills, the advising of client skills, the negotiation skills, and so on. We have to prepare our students for the practice of law at the highest levels of the profession. And in terms of the values, I want our students to graduate with a commitment to using law to pursue justice. Doesn't matter to me whether they're liberal or conservative. Doesn't matter whether they're going to a firm or going to a public interest organization. I hope that all of our students graduate with a sense of justice and a commitment to pursuing justice. I remember in prior meetings, you've given comparative statistics that showed the percentage of alumni making donations at Berkeley and that it was much lower at, than at peer schools particularly public schools like Michigan and Virginia. How does that look today? It's true today as well that we do not have the annual giving that our pure public schools do, let alone private schools. I think we're now at about 19% annual giving. It's gone up a bit over the last few years. Um, University of Virginia has about 55% annual giving. University of Michigan Law School has about 35% annual giving. So we lag far beyond our public peer schools in this regard. I spent a lot of time thinking about why. I spent a lot of time thinking about what can we do to change that? I worry that many of our alumni don't realize that we are not supported by the state of California anymore. That they remember when they came here or perhaps they believe it should be the state's responsibility. I do too, but it's not gonna happen. So I don't know that our alumni realize how much we are dependent on philanthropy, on tuition, because we don't get state money. I think some of it is that historically, Berkeley Law had not done a good job of instilling in students when they were here, the expectation that they'll be alumni and give back I spent 21 years on the faculty at USC, and USC did such a good job from the moment students arrived on campus saying, you're part of the Trojan family and you're going to be expected to give back. Um, one of the things that our development office has created in the last few years is what they call the Berkeley Alumni in Residence Program, the BEAR program, to make the students while they're here feel that they're part of a community. And they're going to be expected to give back to the community. Um, Aaron Deneen, who is on this call, has done a great job of heading that up. And we could providing free coffee to the students every Monday 
Um, they gave stress relief bags to the first year students before the first semester exams, um, a midway through law school party for them and so on. And I think it's part of instilling that in them. Um, some of it may just be that there isn't a, a, a spirit of giving back with our Berkeley alumni. And we've got to figure out how to engender that spirit. Um, I, I really would love to see us, even if we can never get to the University of Virginia level, we should be able to get to 25 or 30% annual giving. And that would make such a great difference. So here, I'll turn to you, the alumni. If you're giving, please continue. If you're not giving, consider it, even if it's a small gift, it makes a difference. And if you're so inclined, reach out to some people from your class, encourage them to give. This is how we can change that. Thank you. This is off topic from the law school, but do you think it's likely that SCOTUS will gut the EPA and what effect if it does? I am very worried about it. It's a case that was argued Monday in the Supreme Court. It's a case called West Virginia versus EPA. I should disclose that I filed an amicus brief on the side of the EPA on behalf of four United States senators, Sheldon Whitehouse, Bernie Sanders, Richard Blumenthal, and Elizabeth Warren. And I have an, a column in today's online ABA journal about the case. Um, my hope is that the Supreme Court will dismiss the case for lack of standing. There is at this time no plan in effect regulating greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. The Obama administration had its clean power plan. The Trump administration had its affordable clean energy plan. Neither is in place now. So there's nothing to challenge. If the Supreme Court doesn't dismiss on standing grounds, I would hope they would affirm broad authority of the EPA to regulate power plants, which are the largest stationary source for greenhouse gas emissions. But I'm very worried and I'm worried about whether the Supreme Court is gonna narrowly interpret the Clean Air Act. I'm worried about whether the Supreme Court is gonna narrowly interpret the powers of administrative agencies to deal with problems like this. Um, so it's a case that I'm very aware of, as I say, having written and filed a brief in the case, um, and I am concerned. Isn't our public mission undermined by supporting continuing professional education with business strategies favoring the attempt to win in bankruptcy, which inherently transfers net costs to the public? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, you know, our public mission is to use law to make our society better. In terms of bankruptcy, there's certainly times when I think that bankruptcy serves the public interest, and there's times where I think bankruptcy doesn't serve the public interest. Um, I filed two amicus briefs this semester. The other was in a bankruptcy proceeding. It was in a case involving Johnson & Johnson, which spun off a new division, and it gave to that division all of its liabilities with regard to women who have suffered ovarian cancer and the use of Johnson & Johnson products like baby powder, it gave this new division no assets, just all of the liabilities from the use of Johnson & Johnson products in the relationship to ovarian cancer. I think that this is outrageous. I think this very much undermines the public interest. Um, and that's why I filed an amicus brief in the case urging the court to not allow companies to use the bankruptcy law in that way. So I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I certainly oppose the use of bankruptcy in a way that would be inimical to its social good. This next one is a comment. In my years at the law school and since, no dean has been as communicative with the law school community as you, and none has come anywhere near being as forthcoming. Thank you for the good work. It's certainly one of the components of future alumni generosity. That's so kind of you to say. I got goosebumps as Charles was reading that. You know, it's a, I feel so tremendously fortunate to be at Berkeley Law. And one of the great strengths of this law school is our alumni community. And so I plan to continue to send 
quarterly statements and there's urgent matters, more frequent statements to do town halls and programs like this, but it also goes both ways. Our alumni should feel free to reach out to me anytime by email or phone. If you have concerns, comments or thoughts about what we can be doing better, we're all one community. With the UC system no longer requiring standardized tests for undergraduate admissions, is the law school reconsidering the use of the LSAT for admissions? The American Bar Association, as a requirement for accreditation, requires that law schools use the LSAT or a comparable test. So we do not have the option of not having the LSAT or a standardized test. Now, it may be that the American Bar Association will reconsider its accreditation standards. And it may be that schools look to things other than standardized tests. Um, and I'm glad to participate in a more philosophical discussion about are standardized tests like the LSAT a good thing or a bad thing? Do they increase diversity and opportunity or decrease diversity and opportunity? Um, and we could have that discussion, um, but it is academic in the sense that we have no alternative. Also keep in mind that a quarter of our US news rankings are based on the entering qualifications of students, the LSAT and GPA. And so if we didn't use the LSAT, unless US news changed its measure, that it would practically be impossible. Um, I was in a meeting this morning from 7.30 to 8.30 with representatives of the Law School Admissions Council talking about future in this regard. Um, I think there will be developments, but I don't think they're gonna happen imminently. Has the class of 2020 commencement date been set? And is it possible to provide travel stipends for student for graduates working in the public interest? I think the answer is yes, and I fear no. Um, the yes part of it is the commencement for the class of 2020 and 2021 will be on Saturday, May 21st at the Greek Theater at 9 a.m. And I hope that all of you from the class of 20 and 2021 will be able to come. In terms of travel stipends, we can look into it. And if members of the class could create a fund to help those who can't afford it, come back to do that. But I fear that it's not something that the law school has money to be able to pay for. Um, as I say, I'm especially concerned about finances for the coming fiscal year with this five and a half million dollar unexpected hit. I don't know that we could create a fund from law school revenues to pay for that as much as I want to. But if the classes wish to create a fund to help each other, I think that would be wonderful. And I will just add, Erwin, that a formal invitation goes out to all graduates of those two classes next week, confirming the date and the logistics. Okay, we'd sent the date out, I know, before, but the formal yeah. invitation will go out. And barring an unexpected public health development, our commencement for the class of 2022 will be on Friday, May 13th. As I said, the commencement for the class of 2020 and 2021 will be on Saturday, May 21st, and they will be joyous occasions. <laughs> Do you think there's any chance that SCOTUS will reverse course and start reining back gerrymandering and voter suppression, given apparent buyer's remorse by Chief Justice Roberts of his prior opinions in this area? I fear not. Um, in 2019, well, that's just three years ago, in Rucho versus Common Cause, the Supreme Court held that there cannot be challenges to partisan gerrymandering in federal court. Chief Justice Roberts wrote that opinion. I don't see any indication that he has buyer's remorse about that holding. Now, there can be challenges to partisan gerrymandering in state courts under state constitutions. In the last two months, the North Carolina Supreme Court and the Ohio Supreme Court have found the partisan gerrymandering there to violate their state constitutions. And California and other states have independent districting commissions. In terms of race discrimination in voting, in 2013 in Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court ended the so-called preclearance requirement 
the part of the statute that says that jurisdictions with the history of race discrimination and voting need to get pre-approval before changing their election systems. That was a 5-4 decision with Chief Justice Roberts writing the majority opinion. And on July 1st, 2021, in Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee, the Supreme Court six to three substantially weakened the protections of section two of the Voting Rights Act that says that state and local governments can't have election systems that discriminate against minority voters. The one sign of hope that I think the question implies is a few weeks ago, the Supreme Court handed down a ruling in a case called Merrill versus Milligan, a three judge federal court in Alabama. And it's worth noting two were Trump appointees and one was a Clinton appointee found that the Alabama districting discriminated against black voters. Sadly, the Supreme Court five to four said that that districting can go into effect for the May primaries, the November election. And Roberts joined the three liberals in dissent. But I don't see the Supreme Court at this point reconsidering Rucho or Brnovich. I feel so lucky to have attended law school when I did. It now appears much more difficult both to be admitted to law school and to fund it. What do you Me see too. as the biggest obstacles for students who want to attend law school today? Oh, I so agree with that. Um, I went to law school and the tuition was $2,400, $2,700, and $3,000. And students protested when tuition was raised to $3,000. I paid for all of law school with $10,000 in loans and working several part-time jobs during law school. Um, now, both our in-state and out-of-state tuition is over $60,000. So cost is an enormous obstacle. What frightens me most is the students who don't apply because of sticker shock. They see what it costs and decide that it's too expensive. And we need to find ways of getting the word out that scholarships are available. We don't want to turn away anybody because of the inability to afford law school. And so that I think is a substantial obstacle. Let me broaden this a little bit. One of the things I'm very honored to be able to do is this year, I'm the president of the Association of American Law Schools. And the Association of American Law Schools did a study called Before the JD Study. And it found that over half of all law students decided to go to law school before they even went to college. And almost 55% of all law students have a parent who has a graduate or advanced professional degree. We have to change that. As I've said to you at other meetings, I'm the first in my family to ever go to college. Me and my parents, my brother, sister went to college. We need to find a way of reaching students in middle schools and high schools to inspire them to want to go to law school. We need to make sure that students from all financial and social backgrounds apply to and come to law school. And so this is something that Berkeley takes a lead in, but we have to work with other law schools and all law schools to be part of this. Do you think there are any positive prospects for voter rights protection or is it all doom and gloom? I'm always an optimist and I believe that in the long term, there will be voter rights protection. There could have been this year, but the Republicans filibustered the voting rights bill and two of the Democratic senators, Senators Manchin and Sinema, wouldn't go along with suspending the filibuster to get voting rights laws adopted. The one place where I can imagine a law getting through because it has bipartisan support isn't about voter rights, but it, the statute that governs counting of electoral votes, the Electoral Count Act of 1887 is terribly antiquated and needs to be fixed before the 2024 presidential election. And Susan Collins, a Republican, some Democrats are spearheading reform, but that doesn't repair the Voting Rights Act. That doesn't deal with voter suppression. Maybe it's gonna take marches like that which occurred in Selma, Alabama that led to the Voting Rights Act and public pressure to get senators to adopt this. I think that, and I don't mean this is partisan, I think that it's unfortunate that right now it's become so partisan that Republicans see it in their political advantage to suppress voter turnout 
and Democrats see it in their advantage to increase voter turnout. And I wish we could get past that and for us to believe it's in everyone's advantage to have mo more voters be able to vote. There are a number of questions regarding the Alameda County CEQA issue and decisions. Sure. Uh, one of our guests has provided a partial answer. I'll read this as a comment. Here in the legislature, we are working on ways to resolve the issue this year. Please communicate to your legislators that resolving this issue is important beyond the students who would not be admitted. The effect on the law school today is new information for me. Thank you. It's because this is about a statute, the California Environmental Quality Act, the legislature can fix it. Now, my idea would be at least there'd be a fix to help Berkeley for the coming year. But I think that what the judge in Alameda County ruled could have such dramatic implications for the whole state of California. The California Environmental Quality Act applies if it is a quote, project. He said that enrollment is a project and he defined an environment very broadly beyond what the legislature thought when it adopted CEQA. Well, if that's so, then any time a UC school, a Cal State school, a community college, a K through 12 school changes its enrollment, that's a project that requires the full environmental study. This is gonna shift control over enrollment from regents and school boards and educators to judges under a statute that was never meant to use for that purpose. So I echo what the comment was in the chat. I know that there are legislators working on this. And if you here can reach out to your assembly member and state senator to fix this, um, it really matters for this, you know, this campus, but for all public education in California. Thank you, Erin. There are a number of additional questions. Perhaps we could roll it over to your next town hall meeting. We're right at the uh, one o'clock hour. I apologize for the questions that I didn't get to, but I will look forward to doing another town hall. And if I didn't get your question, feel free to email me it directly. My email is easily found on the website. I'm the only Chemerinsky. Um, it's E-C-H-E-M-E-R-I-N-S-K-Y at berkeley.eu. And if you send me your question, I promise to get you an answer quickly. And feel free to communicate me anytime, as I say, with your comments and thoughts. Again, thank you for taking time from your busy schedule. Thank you, Charles, for reading the questions. And I look forward so much to working together in the next five years to enhance the wonderful quality of this great law school. Thank you all so much.